So I want to talk, start talking about at least uh, Robert Owen's utopian socialism. So this is something that is brought up in the Communist Manifesto by uh, Marx and Engels. And um, they credit Owens was, with being a, a big inspiration for what, uh, you know, what they're, they're thinking about. Uh, but they do have some pretty sharp criticisms of Owen and others like him. They throw him into this category of utopian socialism. So I wanna unpack that a little bit um, and, and show you uh, what they mean. Okay, so Robert Owen uh, gets some partners, financial backing, and they buy the new Lanark cotton mill in Scotland uh, from Owen's father-in-law, David Dale. Now, we saw just briefly, I mentioned it up above, David Dale in, I think it was 1785, bought the Lanark cotton mill in partnership with Arkwright, the guy who built the first factory. Okay, so this new Lanark cotton mill is, you know, in the Arkwright style. It's a water frame cotton mill and it uses child labor. And Robert Owen has just become uh, the fine new owner of, of this factory. And he finds that there are 2,000 employees, uh, you know, and he bought this from his father-in-law. So this is his wife's dad, David Dale, and he's getting into the family business. Uh, there's 2,000 employees, 500 of which are children, many of whom arrived to the factory at the age of five or six. Uh, and, you know, what he also finds is, oh, you need very small children to keep the factory running because they got to climb under the machines while they're running and clean them out. <clears throat> um, but Owen does find the conditions, the working conditions unacceptable and he tries to ameliorate the most exploitive uh, aspects of it. Okay. Now, right about this time in Parliament, there's the Health and Morals of Apprentices Act. So here's that word, apprentices. And it's introduced by Robert Peel, now Sir Robert Peel. So, uh, you know, in, in 1790, he, he bought a seat on, in Parliament and he bought a, a big estate in the countryside. Uh, sort of all as one package deal. And now uh, in 1800, he has been created a baronet. And so now he is part of the peerage. Now he is of nobility. So again, uh, Peel's grandfather was a yeoman farmer. And Robert Peel now is Sir Robert Peel and one out of 10 millionaires in the country and sitting in parliament. Uh, fabulously wealthy, fabulously powerful now. This is quite a rise uh, in status. And now he's not only wealthy, but he also has a title of nobility. He just bought it. That's easy when you're rich. Um, so, so, even the vestiges, the remnants and, and traces of, of feudalism uh, can just be bought by a capitalist. You know, you can just, hey, I'm, I'm a baron now. I, I got a sir title in front of my name. Um, and of course, Robert Peel uh, made his money by exploiting child labor by getting these kids out of the workhouses and putting them to work, cleaning out the machines while they're running. Um, and so he introduces this bill that requires proper ventilation and cleanliness of mills. You know, now that he's fabulously wealthy and he can afford to do so, now he's gonna introduce this legislation and make it hard for other people to compete with him. 
um, the apprentices, quote unquote, to be given basic education and to attend religious services at least once per month. Um, and we see, you know, they're working these factories 24 seven. They're working two shifts, two 13 hour shifts that overlap uh, at some point in the day where they switch out, but the machines keep running the whole time. Um, the apprentices are, are to be provided clothing. Uh, apprentices are not to work more than 12 hours per day. Okay, so these small eight-year-old eight-year-old girl should now will not be allowed to work more than eight, than 12 hours per day. In the past, she might be working far more than that, but now we're going to set the rule to only 12 hours, only 12 hours a day. Uh, and that doesn't include meal breaks. So if she takes uh, a half hour meal break here and a half hour meal break there, um, however the schedule works out, that doesn't count as part of the 12 hours. So that can make up 13 or 14 hours that uh, this eight year old girl is in the factory. Under the new laws, under the law before this, she could be there 16 or 18 hours of how many, how long can she stay awake? Let's see, let's find out. Send her under the machines while they're running. See if she gets killed. If she gets killed, then, oh, maybe we should have given her, we should have sent her back to the, the barracks uh, for a rest. Uh, but if she doesn't get killed, evidently she doesn't need the rest. And if she does get killed, we can just order another one from the poorhouse, from the workhouse. <clears throat> um, Now, apprentices are not to work at night anymore. They were working at night. I mean, obviously, if you're working an 18 hour shift, it's hard to avoid night work. Um, and this is all good and fine, applies to apprentices. These are the children that come from the workhouse. That's what apprentice means. So these are, you have a family that, that ends up in the workhouse and they're there because none of them are able-bodied workers. That's the way the law is reading. And uh, maybe in order to try to get out of their situation or maybe they're forced into it by the people running the workhouse, they send off their very young child to the factory to start working. Um, so these new rules apply to apprentices from the workhouse. They're not going to stop the practice. They're just going to move up. Uh, but this does not apply to free children, so-called free children, um, who were, in fact, the growing majority of the child laborers in the factories, because the factories didn't need to be next to water. So factories can now be in the cities where there's a lot more population and a lot more children to exploit. Um, and they don't need to, they don't need to use the resources of the workhouses. So if you have a steam engine running things instead of a water wheel, uh, the apprentice thing isn't really, that's not a thing anymore. And that's the stage that they're at. So in some respects, this is uh, a song and dance pony show, um, a dog and pony show, as we say. Uh, So that's that. All right. The revolution in France continues. Napoleonic Wars. Okay, so these, these are the properly so-called Napoleonic Wars when Napoleon is the consul and um, fighting across the continent and, and being very uh, expansionistic. This is when the French Empire uh, grows dramatically and, and and Napoleon is invading other countries and invading them with some degree of a sense that he feels, of course, that he's liberating the people, but the people themselves to some degree feel that he's liberating them because he's destroying the old feudal order. Uh, if, if not by, um, uh, you know, the, the capitalist bourgeoisie, uh, then by Napoleon, the feudal order is being torn apart. Um, Napoleon's just doing it in the old fashioned way. 
uh, he now, now, uh, but uh, in 1804, then uh, he's crowned emperor of France. So before this, it was still a republic, but in 1804, now we're to the French Empire. So this is the what is called the first French Empire, um, where Napoleon is now the emperor and he rules as a monarch uh, of an, an imperial multinational uh, kingdom empire on the model of like the Holy Roman Empire. Okay. Um, so now the French Revolution is back to monarchy. So we have a restoration of monarchy, just like we had restoration of monarchy in England. And this is a very uh, autocratic, arbitrary, absolutist monarchy that Napoleon is running. Uh, I should say, though, at the same time that it is absolutist and autocratic, it is liberal in the sense of, you know, Paxton's definition of liberalism. Um, Napoleon is reforming the laws, uh, making them more comprehensible, making them more uniformed and fairer. Uh, you know, he really does improve the legal structure. He is. Um, improving education, uh, providing public education and providing avenues for people to get educated and, and move up in society and especially move into the administration of the government. And he's throwing out restrictions from the old feudal order of who could serve in the government and things like that. Uh, but it's very centralized. It's a centralized control mechanism. Um, and uh, highly, uh, how do I want to say it? Highly structured and highly um, planned. It's it's a he he has a very centrally planned and structured form of government that's fairly I mean fairly successful. Um, <clears throat> Uh, successful for the for him and even for the French people, but for other countries, he's causing chaos all around Europe. And England is the actually uh, is becoming over this time period is becoming the major military force that is able to stand against uh, Napoleon. Little by little, uh, England is becoming. Uh, the military force that is able to fight back against Napoleon. <clears throat> and, and England, of course, being drawn into this. And so this is exasperating grain prices still. And um, so all the issues that were emerging at uh, earlier on are just uh, getting bumped up again. Okay, and Joseph Marie Jacquard um, invents the Jacquard machine. Now this is um, uh, a very ingenious um, uh, development. You know, he really perfects what Bouchon, Falcon, and uh, Balcassan had had worked on. Um, you know, seventy five years before. He now is uh, has really perfected a mechanism that you can attach to a handloom that will draw uh, warp cords like a draw boy and do it mechanically. And so um, this uh, this makes. Uh, that work better, and especially the draw loom, um, it makes it work more efficiently. The draw loom still requires, if I understand correctly, still requires two people to operate it, but 
uh, the the work process is sped up quite significantly, and and there's more accuracy. Yeah, so um, that's good. Um, <clears throat> So we're kind of, you know, getting to the tail end of the technological innovations in the textile industry. What we're moving into now is looking at the, the social aspects of the aftermath of the technology, um, including that technology of manipulating labor in the factory system. That's a technology. Uh, the Luddite movement emerges in 1811. Um, it's a secret society. It's led by craftsmen, shop owners. So these are like burger style uh, production workshops. And they are tied to the old traditional ways of manufacturing textiles. And uh, of course, there's falling prices for textile because you have these cotton mills that are producing um, large quantities of material. And you have the power loom. So the Cartwright power loom is coming online slowly but surely. It's not quickly adopted, but it is being adopted. And people are making modifications to make it run more smoothly. And um, <clears throat> so the traditional textile workers working in cottage style industries like in their own home or in, in small workshops and community workshops and things like that are not able to compete. Uh, unemployment is uh, creeping up on them. They're falling into the workhouses and um, their whole way of life is being destroyed. And, and, and so they resort to the destruction of the bourgeois production textile machinery, uh, the tart Cartwright power looms and the spinning mules um, and all these industrial scale factory uh, machinery. They're breaking into the factories and sabotaging the machines, breaking them and burning them, things like that. Uh, there's a large scale military repression of the Luddites. And um, and uh, something that I don't have in this outline, but this is really where the uh, modern policing um, begins to emerge in England is in response to the Luddites and trying to get secret information on this secret society and infiltrate those groups and things like that. Um, Lord Byron, you may have heard of him. He's a, you know, a poet, a well-known English poet. He's in your, your, your English literature books from high school. Um, he gives a speech in the House of Lords uh, and uh, a pretty impassioned and pretty famous uh, speech and something that made a big splash at the time, denouncing factory work conditions and um, and denouncing the repression of these Luddite protests that, that are going on. Uh, and I should say, Lord Byron was, you know, he's a poet that's in our textbook. And the reason why he's in those textbooks is because at the time he was a very, he was famous as a, a famous person. He was a celebrity. And so when he gave this speech uh, on the floor of the House of Lords, uh, it made the newspapers and, and it made people pay attention. So uh, that was quite significant. Um, but in the, it, this is all in the lead up to what uh, this bill, the frame breaking bill that ultimately passes and it makes uh, machine breaking as they called it, a capital crime, meaning that you could get the death penalty for sabotaging a factory machine, especially these, um, the spinning mule and the water frames and the Cartwright power looms. Uh, there's mass show trials with, uh, with people being executed or being sent into forced labor, like being sent to penal colonies in, in uh, um, 
you know, uh, Australia, especially at this time, uh, Australia was a big penal colony and um, uh, thousands of people from the Luddite movement were sent to Australia at this time. <clears throat> So, uh, but Owen's, uh, uh, Owen is uh, continuing his social revolution and thinking about uh, how does he improve the working conditions for his, his uh, workers, including those child laborers that he can't get rid of, uh, but uh, because that's just the way the factory works. Uh, he didn't figure that out, but he did try to make the working conditions better. So even in 1810, he's experimenting with an eight hour workday. Remember that that Apprentices Act reduced it down to twelve, uh, including you know, or on top of that, lunch breaks and everything. So it could be more like a fourteen-hour day. Uh, that's for apprentices, but not the free children who could work any number of hours. Um, and uh, he's experimenting with instituting an eight-hour workday uh, in the midst of all that exploitation that's going on. So he's really thinking outside of the box and taking a risk and, um, and seeing if he can do it. Um, he writes uh, an essay called A New View of Society or Essays on the Principle of the Formation of the Human Character. Uh, so he's really thinking about this. Uh, he writes several other essays that are similar. In 1813 as well, he finds uh, new investors that will allow him to continue to experiment in the way that he wants. He's getting some heat from his investors that he's being too nice to his workers. Uh, but he does find some investors, including uh, uh, Bentham, a, who is actually a philosopher and uh, a utilitarian. So if you've heard of utilitarianism, that comes from Bentham. Bentham's one of the investors at this point. Uh, but he find, finds some, some investors that are interested in the social experiment that he's carrying out. And so they give him some leeway. By 1817, he's developed the slogan, and I think this indicates that he's actually successfully and, and universally implementing this uh, eight hours labor, eight hours recreation, eight hours rest. And, uh, and that makes a lot of sense. And of course, we in the United States, um, if you're a person who has to work, maybe you don't have to work and you haven't realized this, but but uh, for those of us who have to work, um, it's very familiar to think of a workday as being eight hours. And that eight hour workday is very much attributable to Owen because nobody else was thinking about eight hours. They're thinking like 12, you know, that seems fair. Um, so the eight hour workday is really something that Owen champions um, and is not only just an individual factory owner who's championing this and implementing it, but also a person who's willing to write essays and get out in public and give speeches and propagandize for this sort of thing. And he does so quite successfully as, as we will see. So one of the things that he does is he writes a report on the poor laws uh, to the poor laws committee in the House of Commons. And uh, he talks about his new view of society and speaks of the root cause of suffering in the country uh, to be the competition between human labor and machinery. You know, so this is very much tying into the Luddite movement and their concerns. And he's trying to 
um, help the politicians make sense of that and, and leverage that experience and, and think of it as what is the root cause of all this chaos and this unrest? Is that the capitalists, uh, although he wouldn't have had all this terminology because Marx had, but he is developing this terminology and he's developing these ways of talking about this. Uh, so much of the analysis uh, and the narrative that I've been giving in these lectures um, uh, is owed to the 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 exploratory exploratory analysis of somebody who's on the ground and seeing factory working conditions on a day by day basis and is responsible for it. Um, he's working out the vocabulary and the concepts to, to give the kind of analysis uh, that ultimately marks um, perfects in many ways. Okay, uh, so he thinks about the root cause. What is it? It's you're pitting human labor against machinery. Uh, and uh, in his mind, maybe we just shouldn't do that. So he speaks of a new moral world and recommends um, that the government promote in whatever way possible uh, intentional communities that's a communes um, the more i don't know if it's popular but the more uh, the more the term of art or the 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 uh, let's say proper way of saying it nowadays is uh in, intentional communities communes nowadays don't like to be called communes they like to be called intentional communities, um, meaning in 2021. Uh, but back in the 60s, uh, the 1960s, we would have called these communes. Um, these are mainly uh, agri, what he recommends is mainly agricultural uh, production taking place, um, but along with the newest machinery. So he's not a Luddite. And I should say that the term Luddite is used in a um, pejorative way for anyone who like doesn't like technology. So if, if your grandmother is always complaining about the cell phone and how it doesn't work right, uh, she's a Luddite. Or if, or, if, uh, or if your grandma is telling you, oh, put your phone down, um, she's being a Luddite uh, in this, in this uh, loose way of speaking. Uh, it just means somebody who hates technology. Uh, but Owen is not saying that he dislikes technology. He just doesn't want to make human labor compete with machinery. He wants them to work in harmony. And he thinks of these communities should be relatively self-sufficient so that they would have an economy that is fairly closed as much as possible so that you know one member in the community is providing products to another member of the community and it's certain, most of the commerce is circulating within the community. So he's thinking of relatively isolated communities at a small scale. Um, <clears throat> He develops this further in his in his new paper, paper articles and other essays, and kind of hits upon uh, a size of like 500 to 3,000 people as the optimum size for these uh, intentional communities, having a, a variety of employments. Um, so you'd have you know uh, the the blacksmith, and you'd have the weaver, and You'd have the soap shop, and you know you have all these different things operating, uh, but make it so that it is a relatively closed economy. And he suggests the communal raising of children, so that everyone would have a small apartment. Um, so, like a couple would have a small apartment, and they could have children and raise the child till they're approximately three years old. But after that point, the child would be offloaded to um, an educational facility where they'd be taken care of in a nursery and, 
and educated and and of course the parents would see their children and have contact with them they just wouldn't have to worry about them there would be specialists who would be educating the children and then they could just be the parents and, uh, um, he also envisions like unions among communities so that you could have one community in one part of the country or another community and they might have you know some sort of an agreement so that they could work on a common project and there could be all sorts of networks of these common projects that they're all working on and ultimately that creates kind of a a, a democratic a relatively horizontal but democratic sort of federation of communities that may, might then be able to form organizations at a higher level or something like that Um, now, a key feature of this and what makes it utopian and, and, and what <clears throat> Marx and Engels uh, particularly criticize about Owens is that it, his socialism doesn't envision any change in the government or the institutions of governments. Uh, you know, you don't have to change the electoral process you don't change, have to change who's in charge you don't have to change anything you can just go off and create your own community and live within the larger uh, nation states um, and that this will all develop organically progressively and then eventually change the world when everybody sees how beautiful this way of living is um, and that's what makes it utopian uh, in the eyes of Marx and Engels. And, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak more about that in a later video. Okay. So uh, Owen uh, creates the Institute for the Formation of Character. So this is his educational facility. Uh, from infancy to adulthood. So he kind of tries to implement those ideas about, about uh, taking children at a very young age and putting them into an institutional setting that, that educates them and provides them with some kind of uh, community education. So he has this facility up and running in 1818. Uh, quite interesting. All right, so I think I'm going to cut this video off here and then just separate this into some smaller chunks.